My name is Christopher Neugebauer. I'm a uh, honours graduate of the University of Tasmania and I'm, I'm attending on behalf of the University of Tasmania for this. Um, I'm also past convener of, or current convener of PyCon Australia and I've been speaking at DevWorld at every one of these conferences since 2009. Um, and Today I'm giving a talk um, where I chose not to censor myself before I submitted the topic and they actually published it in its entirety, so thank you Tony for doing that. Uh, it's called Sensible Web API Design for People Who Really Should Know Better. Um, so who doesn't think they should know better? Good, okay, you're welcome to hang, a lot, hang around but I don't think it will be terribly useful to you. Um, who here can actually, like, who's here is paying attention up the back? Cool. You up the back, you should like pay attention and stuff like that. Not, not you, you're fine, you can stand there if you want. You can sit down, there's seats. Cool? No? Okay, um, so I wrote this talk um, while I was, well, um, I was very unhappy with a project that I was working on at the time that I submitted the, uh, the abstract to this, or wrote the abstract to this. Um, so it's very much, um, a product of opinion from that particular project in general. Um, but it's a talk about the philosophy of API design. Uh, it's informed by work in writing Android applications. Uh, when I deal with mobile stuff, I'm writing Android applications as other people are doing the iOS stuff. I also do a lot of Python development, um, doing, um, doing web infrastructure. So I have published my own APIs and I've written Python apps that have to consume APIs. Uh, what I'm saying here tends to be mostly opinion. Um, because this is a design talk, um, you know, there's no hard and fast rules. Uh, what I hope to do today is sort of convey some underlying ideas and hopefully uh, you'll pick out what is actually important in this talk and what is just me ranting. Um, so the talk is actually a, a combination of fact and fiction and thought experiments. Um, Indeed, what I'm going to be doing a lot in this talk is explaining deliberately the wrong way to do things in the hope that you'll notice what I'm saying is utterly, utterly stupid and that you, wait, you can go off and do ex the exact opposite of what I say. I think that would be really cool. Um, and yeah, so um, last year I gave a, uh, I gave a talk uh, on pretty similar things. Um, I really enjoyed giving that talk. Uh, some people laughed at one of my slides. Uh, yeah, th that was nice. Um, Yes, yeah, so I was, I was kind of hoping that this talk would be a revolution in common sense for API design, and unfortunately it really wasn't. Um, so I'm going to come back and like, do more of the same in this talk, uh, because APIs suck. As a mobile developer, writing things that interact with web APIs is just a truly dreadful experience and you should never ever do it. But unfortunately we need to, and yet they still stuck. Um, APIs tend to be written by over-enthusiastic uh, developers who want to worry about how to make things cloud scale um, before figuring out how to actually make them usable. Uh, on the other end of the scale, you have database theoreticians who want to make sure that everything is like perfectly normalized and stuff like that. Um, and they can't understand why people just can't talk to a database and stuff like that. Um, so I, I'm going to change my tack from what it was last year. Last year I gave technical advice. This year I'm giving design advice. Um, I want to get rid of some misconceptions about API design. Um, and I want to get three key results out of this talk. Uh, firstly, I want to teach you how to make things work regardless of what language or platform you're targeting. Um, be it iOS, uh, Android, or something that's not quite as mobile as these two, such as BlackBerry. Um, I want to talk about how to improve engagement with web developers that aren't on your API team. Uh, be this a, a mobile, um, a mobile uh, development team in the same company, or be it some develop, developer community that you're trying to create. Um, these are both important things. Um, and yeah, I want to rant about a whole series of war stories. Um, based on various projects I've been involved with, and actually by that I mean one particular project. Um, and names have been removed to protect the innocent-ish. Okay, um, yeah. Uh, is anyone taking notes of this talk? Cool, oh cool, I I'd, I'd love to see them. I want to see if I said anything coherent at the end of this, that'd be great. Um, 
So today, um, to set the scene of what we're talking about, we're talking about APIs uh, that are transmitted as JSON over HTTP, because this is basically what everyone does these days. Uh, there are people in enterprise who use XML and, and stuff like that. They can't be helped. Um, yeah. <laughs> Josh is an enterprise developer. He writes, he writes SOAP day in, day out. Um, Yeah, um, you can buy Josh a beer at the end of the conference to, uh, to offer condolences. Um, these sorts of APIs provide access to some sort of bigger application. Uh, so you're providing a mobile client to something like Twitter or something like that. Twitter is a big application, you're just providing a client to it. And they tend to access some sort of data storage somehow. Um, so this talk is composed about of three parts. Um, firstly, I'm going to be looking at some fundamental misunderstandings of JSON. Um, then I'm going to look at how to make APIs nice for users of more than one language. And then I'm going to look at some database theory. Um, and what happens when you let database theory consume your design. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, take a deep breath, relax, enjoy the kitten for the next 20 seconds or so, um, because it'll be the last light relief you'll get for the rest of this talk. It's not necessarily true, but um, we'll see what happens. Okay. So, um, like I said, I was feeling quite angry when I, uh, when I proposed this talk, and I've decided to be deliberately inflammatory. So, I'm going to start with a section that I call the Great JSON Lie. Um, see, it's, it's inflammatory, isn't it? You, you think this is... I've lost you already? Okay. Uh, no suspense then. The Great JSON Lie is that you do not need a schema. Uh, people have decided that because they use JSON, which is known as a schemaless format for sending stuff around, that they don't actually need to use schemas. Um, and to misquote the skyhooks, a schema isn't a dirty word. Um, basically, there's these, these things called NoSQL databases that people who can't figure out how to write Amazon code have decided should be really, really popular. These are things like MongoDB, CouchDB, Cassandra, stuff like that. Um, you know, anything that gets mentioned alongside the word cloud, scale, um, these are all tend to be schemaless databases. Um, and because of these in, in the, uh, the cloud community in particular, schemas become sort of a dirty word. And I hope to convince you that this really couldn't possibly be more unreasonable. Uh, and people who say this are idiots, really. Um, so to demonstrate this, we first need to consider what I mean when I say uh, you don't need a schema. So you need to think of what a schema could actually be. So a schema, according to the dictionary that I found and forgot to cite, uh, is a set of constraints on structure and content, uh, particularly to do with data. Um, now to completely ignore that, I'm going to propose that there are two different types of schemas that you can have. The first is what I call explicit, and the second is implicit. So when you're talking about explicit schemas, you're thinking about things like relational databases, so your table structure, so table names and tables have predefined columns, that's a schema. Um, XML makes a big deal about schemas, you verify everything using a schema language. And programming languages, so um, in the case of C or C++, you're talking about headers, they say how you access classes and functions and methods and stuff like that. Uh, Java interfaces, and if you're not being evil, Objective-C2. Um, and then you have implicit schemas, which are basically the opposite. You have your NoSQL databases, where you can just throw arbitrary doc, uh, JSON documents into your database. Um, JSON, because you know that's just JavaScript objects, and you can shove whatever you want in JavaScript objects, because that's what JavaScript people like for some reason. And languages with dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, signatures. So that's like JavaScript again, Ruby, um, Python, if you're being less rigid than, than you'd like to be. Um, and so th these are the sorts of things that people tend to deal with on the web for some reason. Um, and that's sort of carried on to people developing on mobile applications, uh, even though they're using languages that have explicit schemas in, in and of themselves, like Objective-C, Java, those sorts of things. Um, so when you have an explicit schema, you have a project and you have an API, and then you have some sort of automatic constraints testing that comes with the... Um, 
that comes with a tool chain that you select to use. So if you've got a, uh, an SQL database, you get errors when you try to access a column name that doesn't exist. If you access a table that doesn't exist, your app crashes. Um, with implicit schemas, though, um, you need a bit more discipline. Um, Firstly, you need to ensure that things are being accessed correctly. So if you've got a well-defined interface, then you, you sort of control everything that sits around, sits around your API. Um, but then you could be less disciplined, and you have all of your code accessing your API, and then that's really difficult to test. Or you could have like, the code that looks like it should access the API not touching the API, because that's where you're testing it, and your testing doesn't actually touch the real thing. Or you could be testing completely separately. Yeah, it's dreadful. Um, I'm going to just take that in for a moment. I like that slide. Good, I got a laugh. That's great. Um, so what does this mean for you? So if we're using, uh, if we're using JSON, because this is the predominant language uh, for sending stuff across APIs on, on the web and by extension mobile, um, we need to examine what the consequences are of doing these things properly. Um, and I assert that if you're dealing with a schemaless system, one that does not provide a schema for yourself, the role of the schema ends up being taken by your own project. That is to say, your project becomes the schema. Um, what? Um, so I said earlier, the role of a schema is to enforce content and structure. Um, and this is... So if you have something that's tested automatically, you have something that automatically says what things are going to go where. Um, if you don't have something that's going to control what goes where, then you need to do it yourself. That is to say, if you have an implicit schema, your role is to enforce what things go where. So you need to think what things need to be done um, to control these. And I, I propose that the roles are to define what valid content is, so what content is provided by endpoints and what's expected to be sent to endpoints, ensuring that the structure that surrounds this content is, um, is enforced and is sensible, and that everything behaves as it has been defined, so performing verification. So I'm going to look at these three things in turn. Um, the first one is the idea of defining content, or defining what content is acceptable. And there's no real way around this. The only way to do this is through documentation. Um, another lie is that, you know, if you write something with good enough variable names, it becomes self-documenting. That is also patently false. Uh, it's patently false because you can have a JSON snippet that looks like this. Um, it, has a, it has a name, it has an address, it has an ID. Uh, what should this thing be representing? It's got a name, it's got an address, what is it? It's a person? Yeah, it could be a person. Uh, but no, this is a contrived example, so it's actually a bookmark. It has a, a name, which is a title, and a web address. See, contrived. Um, it's a contrived example. Uh, so with that contrived example taken care of, I can now say that external documentation is absolutely necessary. Evidence is great, isn't it? Um, so let's look at what some documentation should look like. Um, here's this... Um, uh, here's this bookmark thing that I was talking about uh, just then. Uh, it looks like this. We have an endpoint that says, get a single bookmark. Or it has, a, um, it has a title, it has an explanation, it has a request format, it has a response format. You want to take a photo of me, Tony? Thank you. Um, right, cool. Um, so, yeah, you have a title. What's the point of a title? It's to explain what is going to happen. Now, we're talking REST here because that's what everyone tends to use when they're dealing with JSON over HTTP. Uh, so, you use a verb, because the rest loves verbs. What's a verb here? The verb is to get something. You say this is going to get something. You say it's going to get single, because rest deals with either lists or single entities. So, you get get single object name. Right? Simple. Somebody can look at, it, at an index and figure out where the hell they're going to find this without having to figure out what your URL structure is. Defining documentation in terms of URL structure, I see that done all the time. It's a pain. Um, then you have something that explains what it does. Isn't that great? Short, readable, stuff like that. Um, what a request should look like, so it says where there are variables here, so you can substitute those in, and what gets responded to. Now, on the second page of this, ooh, um, so we have a definition of the request parameters and a definition of the response values. Now, 
Something that is always missed out on are things like these. Examples. Examples are really, really important because they tell you where things are going to, uh, what is going to happen when you deal with something. And here's an example here. It says if you get API bookmark 6, you get something with an ID of 6. So you see that that's what's going to happen. That is something that can be expected. For bonus points, you can automatically test that your documented examples behave correctly. That is to say, you can take the examples that you've put in your documentation and perform testing on these to make sure that when you actually interact with the API, what you say is going to happen in the example is what actually happens. Who here has had documentation where the examples are wrong? Happens all the time. You should automatically test your examples because in doing so, you know that your documentation is going to be right. And I got my animations out of order, so just let's get rid of those. Right, uh, shout out from Python and Standard Library. There's this thing called DocTest. Um, DocTest is really, really cool. It shows you how to embed examples in your Python code and have them automatically tested. So if you want to uh, publish a Python library, you have your standard unit tests to make sure that the functionality is correct, and then you test the documentation. That means that you're sending out correct documentation with your code, and that's really, really cool. You should do that. So in terms of defining content, having thorough documentation means that your, uh, that your content is defined meaningly, meaningfully, English. Have you absorbed that? Makes sense? Cool. No, Paris? Do you want me to repeat? Are you not paying attention? Can you say yes? Good. This is... Okay, um, so second part of this. Um, defining structure. So I'm going to define structure before that and say that this is a set of rules that explain how parts of the system are going to interact with each other. Uh, so if you define structure, then this is all about making sure that the various parts of your system interact with each other and are reflected correctly when you interact with other parts of it. So if you change one thing that's meant to be reflected somewhere else, doing something at one point should actually be reflected somewhere else. And you do this with something called unit tests. Uh, Unit testing tends to actually be a good idea. Uh, that's my technical advice for the talk. Unit testing, it's great, you should do it. Um, <laughs> seriously. Um, so uh, what should you be testing when you, when you go and do something to make this work? Well, the first is to look at something called locality of access. This is to say that if you're going to do something that touches a, um, that touches a data store or something like that, then if you touch something that changes that data store, then that change should be reflected. But if you touch somewhere else that isn't meant to change some state, um, then that shouldn't be happening. You're testing for side effects to make sure that things don't change unexpectedly. Um, if you're exposing everything correctly through an API, then the only place where things should change is if you're touching the endpoints. Um, basically, undocumented changes to these sorts of things uh, mean that you get undocumented side effects, and having inaccurate documentation means your developers are unhappy. Um, if you do automatic schema uh, validation, so if you're dealing with XML, SQL databases, that sort of thing, um, you get these sorts of things. Um, you get the idea of structure of responses for free. Um, if you're using something like JSON, you have to test this for yourself. So you should ask some questions. Uh, do the uh, responses of an API call resemble the documented structure? Uh, are there undocumented fields in a response? So if you call an endpoint, you get stuff that isn't in the documentation. That means your documentation isn't comprehensive. Um, is there something that's in the documentation that's missing from what you get in the reference in, uh, in the, from the server itself? Uh, that means that your server's been mucked up or somebody's over-documented it. Um, basically, if, if any of these things are true, um, then you either have a failure in your API or you have a failure in your documentation. Both are dreadful. Um, the third thing that I think is important is handling garbage. That is to say, uh, if you send some invalid data to your API, uh, what sort of uh, failure responses get, do you get back? Do you get back the failure responses that are actually documented in the documentation? You should be testing that things fail correctly, um, if that makes sense at all. 
Um, so these things are sort of important. Um, testing enforces defined structure and documentation is entirely related to testing. But there is a missing link between these two sorts of things. That's the weakest link. Um, that, you know, it's the best thing I could find for today. Um, who remembers that? Good. Uh, great. Um, goodbye. Um, so the two things that we've looked at so far are important to developers of server-side stuff. So the people going off and implementing a, uh, a server API. Um, but if you've got documentation being produced there and you've got things being tested internally, well, these things aren't actually sufficient to prove that what you're doing is useful to the API developer or the client developer out there who's going to be using the stuff that you have. And to fix that, you need to have verification. Verification is the process of making sure that your API team aren't conducting their work in a padded cell. In particular, we're talking about verifying behavior. And to do that, you need to do client-side testing. So you've done server-side testing. That should be comprehensive. You do that. You should always test on your client side as well, because having a valid implementation demonstrates that the functionality that you're implementing is actually done correctly. Um, so the question is, which functionality should you go off and be testing? Um, now, the problem with getting the same team to verify the API as initially implemented and define the thing is that they're going to likely test the functionality that they believe to be important. And they're going to test it in the same way that they tested it when they tested their server. And that's not a good thing. Um, they can either end up, um, end up testing not enough functionality, um, which means that when you send something off to a um, when you send something off to developers to go and produce a mobile app out of, the API doesn't actually work because it hasn't been verified correctly, uh, or they can send out too much functionality. Um, so you could test absolutely everything. Here's a single tweet from Twitter, and these things highlighted are the text color for hyperlinks in a tweet, the text color for what the tweet should be rendered in, and the back ground image URL. Um, and you know, actually testing all of these things is not going to be useful to anyone except somebody producing the web Twitter client. Um, so over testing can be a bit of a problem here. Um, so the solution that I propose is what's known as clean room verification. And clean room verification is basically where you take a team who didn't write the server and get them to look at your documentation and produce some either a client or some tests based upon it. Um, surprisingly useful stuff because firstly it removes the assumptions of what the server is going to do. It's going to ensure that the documentation you have is comprehensive. Ooh. And it's going to ensure that the documentation is actually, actually accurate. Now there's two ways you can go about doing this sort of thing. You can either have a comprehensive implementation that is producing a reference library it's great because you thoroughly test everything and it's reusable for basically every case you want to use it for. Um, but the problems are that it's time consuming and it's not going to be representative of actual use. Um, unless you're Twitter, in which case your API represents everything that the web Twitter wants to do and nothing else. Um, and the alternative is just to test some expected use cases. Um, the problem with this is that you might not test everything um, and the use cases that you test are just going to be testing the things that you expect to be tested and that's, or implemented, and that's not going to do anything you want. Um, so the answer is actually to have something somewhere in the middle. Right, yes, to have something somewhere in the middle like that. Um, so if you're someone like Twitter, then doing a comprehensive reference library would be a really good idea. I don't think Twitter actually do that, though. Perhaps they should. Um, but if you only have an internal, if you're only producing an internal application, something that only, pro, um, only projects that you are going to approve are going to use, then you know, it's easy enough to just test the expected use cases that you're actually going to use because you have access to the server team and they can go off and fix things for you. You don't get that if you're trying to ask Twitter to do something. If you ask Twitter to do something, they're more likely to just remove it for you. They have done that. Um, but the basic idea is that if you have more eyes, uh, you have better clarity. Um, and that's the end of that. Documentation, test, and verification.
cool. You should do it. Um, so, second part of my talk. Um, I'm going to look at what's needed to make things work sensibly in more than one language. Um, because all too often, if you have somebody going off and developing a server, say, in Python, um, then their assumptions of developing the server are just going to target Python. Or if they're developing it in .NET, then they're probably going to provide you with SOAP. Um, and you don't want that, do you, Josh? No, good. OK, um, so basically, when you're developing with a particular language, your design decisions tend to, tend to uh, reflect the assumptions of that language. So I'm giving this section a subtitle, A Tale of Two Languages, because I'm going to look at two languages. Um, so let's start off with a harmless JSON snippet. In this time, we're actually presenting a person. Uh, his name is Tony Gray. He lives at Douglas Grove, and he has an email address. Um, so OK, JSON snippet has name, has address, has email. Have you read that? Have you laughed? Great. OK, so here's the Python code to do that. Oh, I'll walk you through it. At the top, we have importing the JSON library, because you need a JSON library to parse JSON. Cool. Um, then we're going to load the JSON, which we get somewhere for, out from the ether, because I don't want to write it out again. And then, um, and then we're going to print out the attributes here. So we're going to print J, which is the JSON object. And then we're just doing dictionary access on it, right? So you take the object, uh, the dictionary, and you ask for its attribute as a dictionary key. And that's how Python deals with JSON. Uh, now we're going to look at some Java. So you have a public, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, thingy, 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 thingy. And then um, we've got this dot, um, dot dereferencing of objects. Now, uh, JSON access used to really suck in Java before because it presented something that wasn't quite a dictionary but was still dreadful. Uh, and Google released this thing called JSON. Um, and JSON's really, really cool because it, um, it deserializes JSON objects into Java objects. And you notice there's this thing here where I've said person p and person.class and something like that, and you can dereference these things. So where on earth does this person thing come from? Well, it's actually something I've defined in another class. So I've had to go off and separately predefine what's going to be returned um, as a, uh, in a JSON object. Um, so to make JSON work, you need to predefine stuff. But once you do that, handling JSON is Java, in Java is probably better than in any other language I've dealt with, because you get automatic uh, schema type testing. Um, so provided you predefine everything, um, then everything predefined tends to work as you expect it to. Um, if you've dealt with Python or Perl or something like that in the past, um, this might seem a bit arduous. But, you know, Java people predefine everything beforehand. So you know, what's going to be wrong with predefining just yet another thing? Um, so this comes back to this dichotomy of implicit versus explicit. Um, in the case of Python, it likes dictionary access. Um, but Java likes predefined classes. Um, and Python doesn't tend to care about uh, attribute names or anything like that. You can put whatever you like in a dictionary. You can store whatever you like from a dictionary into a new JSON object. Um, but absolutely everything in Java needs to be predefined unless you're being evil. And if you're evil in Java, things don't tend to work very well for you. Um, I'm reliably informed that Objective-C actually sits somewhere in the middle, which is why I'm not going to talk about it much at all. Um, so let's go back to a hypothetical API, which has this thing that goes, get a list of people. So we've got an end, an, a REST endpoint, and this pulls down a list of people, slash get, slash API, slash people, returns a list of JSON objects. Each of these JSON objects has a name, it has an address, has an email, has an ID. OK? And then in this hypothetical API, we also have a thing that gets a single person. And this returns a JSON object that has a name, that has an address, that has an email address, and has an ID. OK? Has the same attributes as each element of the list we had. So what can we do here? Well, we know that these things have the same attributes, which means they have things in common. This, and we can exploit this commonality. Um, so how do we go about doing, uh, exploiting this uh, commonality? We use something called composition. 
Composition is something that we do a lot of in computer science, um, but we may not be aware that we're doing it because it's a fairly natural thing. Um, but it's worth exploring composition and seeing why you should do it and why it's a good idea. So what is it? Now, composition is taking a combination of parts or elements to form a whole. And I'm specifically going to be talking about combining small parts to make something bigger. So if we have our list of people, this contains a list of JSON objects with a name, an address, an email address, an ID. And we have something that can return a single person, a JSON object with those same attributes. So we can define person as a JSON object with these attributes and enumerate them and enumerate what you have. It's amazing. It says what a person is. And then, and then you can say that get API person ID, well, you can say it returns that, or you can say it returns a single person. Yeah, you can just use labels. It's me excited. Um, even better, as an added bonus, you can define your get list of people endpoint to return a list of people, right? It's a list of people. But wait, there's more. You can define something else. Say you have a team object. Um, then that could have a name, it could have a location, and then it could have a person object embedded in it, and then a list of people objects embedded in it. It's really, really amazing. You can do this, and this is good documentation because it lets you define stuff that's going to be used all across your API, and then you can say it's going to be returned by other things, and that's really, really easy. It makes things easy because you can reuse stuff. So composition promotes concise documentation. Um, because what you, all you have to do to produce good, accurate, comprehensive documentation is to define the objects that you're going to be using and it's going to appear anywhere, and then you define the behavior on, what, uh, on these um, defined objects. So furthermore, desi designing for composition is designing for reuse. Not only do you get your documentation right, you get, um, you get time-saving benefits uh, in terms of... Um, in terms of reusing code and stuff like that. So if you, um, if you have a REST API, you might have a get endpoint, which gets a single person, or you might have a put endpoint where you put something into the, uh, into the data store. You put a person into the data store, which means that you can define a get endpoint in terms of it returns a person. You can define a put endpoint in terms of accepting a person. It's revolutionary, isn't it? Absolutely magical. I thought I'd get, thank you. I thought I'd get, I thought I'd get more like enthralled looks because they're like, nah, nah. Anyway, um, so, so the benefits of this, you get benefits in terms of documentation and you get better uh, benefits in terms, of, um, in terms of testing and verifying your code because you can compose tests as well. Um, this means that you can do verification of things. Uh, you can do the same verification in more and more tests. So you can check to see whether or not you are reusing stuff effectively. So if you've got this, uh, is this test here, this says assert person is valid. Uh, it checks to see whether or not one of our person objects has everything defined correctly and in the same fashion. Um, you can go and use this in another test. So you say, um, does my get person endpoint return a valid person? Or you can say, I want, to get a, uh, I want to get a person object from my API. Then I can test to see whether or not this person is valid. And then I can check to see whether or not the, uh, the ID value is what I uh, originally put in there. But then you can use this same test in something that isn't related to person objects. You can like, do it in this team thing, right? So because team contains people, you can, uh, you can check or do tests that are based on the person objects inside the team objects. And you get uh, added benefits in terms of making sure that everything is, is valid everywhere. You can test more comprehensively. So the take home message is that if you actually desi um, design in terms of composition, then you get thorough testing uh, much more easily. And for my second piece of technical advice uh, for this talk, is that you should get a Java developer if you want to make sure that this works. 
Yep, I said it. Um, yeah, you should hire a Java developer because Java values composition. If you do, if you design for composition correctly, then a Java developer is going to go off and get uh, and, and implement stuff really, really quickly and really easily. If a Java developer doesn't find it easily, then you're probably not doing it right. Um, and in general, having multiple reference implementations is a good idea anyway, because you can, um, you can get developers who use other languages on board with your project. Um, even better, open source your reference implementations if you have them. That way somebody can just go and grab all the code that needs to talk to your service without having to do anything. Um, where's Tim? I was just going to say that Parse was an ex excellent example of this being done right. Um, but Tim's gone, so I won't say that. Have I lost you yet? Oh, fantastic. OK. Um, so part three of the talk, um, where I want to talk about database theory, explain to you how SQL databases work, and explain to you why they're a dreadful idea. Um, or rather, I'm going to explain why resembling an SQL database is a bad idea if you're sending stuff uh, via the web. So. We're talking about APIs that look like this sort of thing, or applications that look like this sort of thing. You've got a mobile application, which is what your user uses. You've got a data store at the end, and you have a service API in the middle. So the service API is the thing that the mobile application talks to, and the API talks to a data store to get stuff out of it and give it back to the user. Um, so it's prudent to consider why we don't have an, or why we have an API in the first place. And the idea is that you have a separation of concerns. That is, what people want to do with mobile apps is different to what people want to do with high-performance databases. Your mind blown? Mm. So databases, what are they? Well, these are things that are generally compute intensive. They do like complex queries and like mash stuff together so that people can find out useful information from a bunch of records that somebody's entered somewhere. Uh, and they tend to have really reliable network links. Um, and they're designed with these in mind. So database protocols tend to be designed for reliable network links. Whereas mobile applications, well, if you leave your processor running for five minutes on most phones, the battery will run out. Uh, and that's unfortunate. Um, and most people are using dreadful networks, uh, which means that you can't have, um, have high performance networking stuff happening. So that's to say that different apps have different concerns. Databases expect things to be efficient, uh, efficiently stored, because that way you can do com uh, computational stuff on them much more easily. Whereas for mobile apps, you don't want to spend much time processing stuff because your processor drains your battery. You just want to have the data that you want given to you. Um, databases value redundancy and separate, uh, and separate queries where, uh, where you don't have redundancy. Whereas mobile apps, Mobile apps like to minimize the number of network requests they have because making requests on mobile network is probably the slowest part of actually doing stuff with networking. Um, and databases like to have long-lived streaming type responses. So you ask for one row, do some processing on it, get another row. Um, whereas on mobile applications, you want to minimize the amount of time you spend on the network lest your mobile phone user go through a train tunnel. Um, these concerns, quite obviously, are not compatible. So you have API services to bridge the gap. So let's look at a pair of these things, uh, because I want to show you something that I had to deal with in a project. Um, uh, in a project. Let's compare the concerns of having efficient data storage with the minimization of network requests, or subtitled, why JSON data should never, ever, 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 ever come normalized. Um, Twitter is an example of over unnormalizing stuff in that uh, this tweet can, uh, includes objects representing the users mentioned in each tweet. That is to say, uh, this has each user has a name, its ID, uh, an expansion of their full name for every time it's mentioned during the tweet. Um, that's non normalization. Whereas I've seen an API that looks like that. So yeah, um, you get a team, um, it has an ID, which is an int, a name, which is a string, and then this manager room and members thing, and you've got these things that are person IDs. Um, 
which looks surprisingly like primary, que uh, primary keys in an SQL database. Um, who here has seen this done in JSON before? Right, so how do we deal with APIs that do this sort of thing? Okay, well, so I've got this manager thing, which takes a person ID, which means we need to get a person down from the API. It's not so bad, that's one extra request, cool. Um, then we've got this room thing where we need to pull down a room from the list of rooms. Great, that's two requests. And then what about this list of members? Oh, well, we've got a request for each person in the list of members that you've got to pull down and do something with. And then you have, um, well, or you could pull down the entire list of people and then filter that. But that's also got its own issues there. And then what if you need to pull down something or a list of these things, which gives you, well, each of those has a manager that you need to pull down and a whole heap of, of members that you need to pull down. Oh, look, there's that one and another one. And oh my God, this is dreadful. I want to stop. So what if you like define a person and you define a room and then you sort of nest them inside the team thing? Right? Surprising how many people don't do that. The hell. So uh, the point here is that JSON is made for nesting, but SQL isn't. Um, and why is SQL not designed for nesting? Because you use joins. In SQL, it's so easy to join. Thank you, Josh. I'm glad someone appreciated that. Um, so how do you do this in SQL? Well, it's really cool. You have a table which says, I have some teams, and this team doesn't have any members because you define a second table which says member X belongs to team Y, and then you match these things together so you get a joined table which consists of team and team member. Okay, so this means you can have like a record for each team member in a team. And what does that look like when you query it? Well, it's cool, you get, you know, you get one person and that's really great. You can say person 593 is member of team one. And then you can say that person 91919 is also a member of team one, as is person 43. Uh, and so you end up having the majority of the information in each row being exactly the same. Uh, when all you're really looking for is that. Um, so what's worse is that if you're really trying to minimize queries, uh, then you expand out the manager ID thing, which gets repeated in every single row, as with the room thing, and then you also expand the person thing out. Um, and basically, this is really, really stupid, and you shouldn't be trying to implement SQL in JSON because they're completely different, and I've just shown you that they're completely different because you can't nest things in SQL, but you can in JSON. So you shouldn't like send normalized JSON. So the take home message here is that your API should not look like your database ever. Because like that doesn't make sense and stuff. So rant over, uh, pretty much the end of the talk. Uh, this talk is about how to make APIs that don't suck. And so I have five questions you can ask of yourself when you're working with a team or producing a server for someone else to use. The first is, can you infer everything from your documentation? If you can, can infer everything from your documentation, then the person who's going to end up interfacing with your API is actually going to know how it works. Secondly, does it actually work as you expected it to work? Thirdly, does somebody else think that it works as you expected it to work? Fourthly, can you do this in a language that isn't Python or Objective-C or something that you didn't implement your server with? And fifthly, does your API not look like SQL? If you get these things right, um, then you probably have an API that doesn't suck. Uh, it's not rocket surgery. Um, yeah, and that, that's the end of my talk. Um, I will now take questions, trolls, or heckles, if you have any. Um, you could also applause for the, uh, for the uh, benefit of the video because Tony's probably going to cut the questions out. Thank you.